Good morning and welcome to our service today. I don't know if you're as hot as we are right now, so uh, if I start to wilt after a while, then you'll know why. We're in a really warm day. If we've got uh, friends calling us from Mumbai or Kuala Lumpur, uh, we rival you with our temperatures today. How do you think about that? And it's normally against the law for our temperatures to be so high. But London's at about 34 today, for example. But anyway, you're very welcome. And uh, I praise the Lord that he's with us. And it's a wonderful thing to know he is present during our time together. Of course, a little later on, we'll be having communion. So if you've never had communion before, or you'd like to just get some, some bread or wine or something that, you're going to, that you've got to hand that you can use, then please feel free to go and do that. And so that you can join in with us when we take communion together, remember the Lord's death as he told us to do so. So I, I trust you're going to enjoy today, although I must say it's a pretty significant, pretty heavy subject I'm going to be preaching on a little later on. I'll explain more about that when I get to it. But first of all, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for the knowledge that you are here by your Holy Spirit. We thank you, O oh Lord God, that you are not only here, you are not silent. You will speak to us, and may our hearts be open to receive what you say and to hear you. Lord, I pray for a blessing upon everyone listening, as well as those here, and I pray that you are honoured and glorified in what takes place. We pray again for the leaders of the countries that are seeking to take their various countries, their various areas, uh, through this pandemic. We pray you give them wisdom and grace, Lord God, the strength to make tough decisions, but Lord God, at all times, you would be with them too and lead them on. We pray for the medical services and other frontline services. We pray that you would have your hand upon them as they go into potentially dangerous situations. Father, we pray that you would give them strength and grace, concentration, that they might do their job well. And Lord, we pray again for a blessing upon them. We pray for all the nations around the world. Lord, some will be less equipped than others to be able to deal with this crisis. We pray, therefore, for places like Africa. We pray your hand upon them. We pray that uh, during this time when so many of them can't get out to work and yet they, they, they eat what they've earned that day, we pray, Lord, you protect them from starvation. We pray that your grace would abound on that great continent. Lord, we ask all these things now. We pray that you are honoured and glorified here. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And during our time together, we'll be looking at various things. Amongst the things I will touch on will be healing. That will come up in my, my message especially. And as I do that, I just want to encourage you, if you've got anything you'd like prayer for, prayer for healing or any other matter in your life, please feel free to contact us. The best way to contact me is on by email, and I would be able to use it from there. If you wanted to do that, just Send an email, a brief email, you don't, don't need to give lots of details about yourself, but if you've got something you'd like us to pray about, then go ahead and just give me what we need in order that we can pray for you. We've had some wonderful examples of people being healed over the course of these last weeks, for which we praise God and we give him the honour in Jesus' name. We've got our first reading coming up now, and uh, this reading is going to be by Michael, and I expect a number of you will recognise it well. Trust that uh, you're blessed by it. Thank you very much. The reading is to be found in the Gospel to Luke. It's really beginning at chapter 6, verse 46. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? I will show you what he is like who comes to me and hears my words and puts them into practice. He is like a man building a house who dug down deep and laid the foundations on rock. When the flood came, the torrent struck that house but could not shake it because it was well built. But the one who hears my words and does not put them into practice is like a man who built a house on the ground without a foundation. The moment the torrent struck that house, it collapsed, and its destruction was complete. Bless you. Well, that's a very well-known story. We'll be looking at it a little bit more later when I speak. But now we've got two songs for us to, to sing together and to praise God with, 
and they also will relate in ways to what we look at a little later when I preach. So enjoy the worship, praise them, I pray you're able to join in with them. And uh, let's, let's lift the bear in the Lord. Amen. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength.
Lord, you're wonderful. Can we come now? We we take the wine. The wine would be poured out. We think at that time, but certainly here we don't have wine to pour out right now. But we take this and we thank the Lord again. Lord, we thank you for this wine, as it reminds us that your blood was shed, poured out, that we might have peace with God. Lord, you're wonderful. That you refuse not him that speaks. For if they escaped not who refused him that spoke on earth, much more shall not we escape, if we turn away from him that speaks from heaven, whose voice then shook the earth. But now he has promised, saying yet once more, I shake not the earth only, but also heaven. And this word yet once more signifies the removing of those things that are shaken, as of things that are made, that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. Wherefore, we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear, for our God is a consuming fire. Welcome to the garden. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to try and give you a, a visual demonstration of what happens when we shake something and what can take place as a result of it. So this is my, one of my pride and joys and I'm going to shake it now. Did you see that happening? Did you see the things that were falling? Today I'm speaking about the shaking of the Lord. It's a subject that God started speaking to me about three months ago or so. What happened at that particular time was that it was quite a new thing to me. I'd read the verses before, but I'd never been quite so taken. It didn't make such an impact on me of this particular subject. But at this time, I felt there was something significant that I had to look at. And if I needed any confirmation, I then, having just finished the time I'd been before the Lord at various things in which he revealed this word to me, and I rang somebody up to do with the church, and I just asked how they were, and they said, I've had a great time, I've been, talk I've been reading all about the, the shaking of the Lord. So and it didn't, that wasn't the, the, the end of that either, if things went on and it, it was as if it was being confirmed, but I was still looking, I suppose, for a sense of what God would say to people through me in this, or was it just for me? But I've come to this point now when I believe it's something that God will have me share, and so I'm going to do that right at this time. The reading that Lynn brought to us was from the book of Hebrews. And in it, the author of Hebrews goes back and he quotes, he quotes the book of Haggai. When it was read to you, you heard these words. He said, Once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. That's an extract from the book of Haggai. And there's more to it after that. Haggai is a very tiny book. It's one of the smallest books in the whole Bible. 
it's one of those ones if you sort of flip through the Bible trying to, to get to, you're likely to go over the pages because there's only two pages in the whole book. And it was, it's also very near the end of the, of the Old Testament. Uh, there's 39 books in the Old Testament and Haggai is number 37. So you can see it's, it's really towards the end of it all. And Haggai said a little bit more than the writer to Hebrews, as well as what had already been shared. There we just heard it. He went on also to say that the things would be shaken would be the sea, the dry land, and all the nations. This was going to be something that was going to be like a universal shaking of the world. God uses crises to speak to mankind. He shakes it. I've said that once before, when it's in suffering and so forth. And you've got to understand that this particular time, he is beginning to shout about this very unpopular subject, may I say, judgment. Judgment is not one thing that preachers tend to lean towards to preach. It's quite easy to preach about God's love and his goodness, and wonderful as they are, and wonderful as he is. But talk about God's judgment, and people will start to get a little bit restless, a bit more unsure about what this is going to be like. But you know, not to preach about judgment is nothing less than a failure before the Lord. Jesus himself preached about it. He preached about it continuously. It's part of his ministry. And in John chapter 5, he even reveals something which might be a bit of an eye-opener. He points out that the Father will not judge anybody. It will be the Son that judges. Now, you think, well, he's the Saviour. And yet the Bible says there, that Jesus himself revealed it, that it will be the Son that is the judge. Well, just think on that one for a moment. He both saves us and he, he brings judgment. In Acts 10, there's a remarkable encounter between the Apostle Paul and the Roman centurion Cornelius. Cornelius has a dream, and as a result of that dream, he sends to ask uh, Peter to come and talk to him. Peter had also been having a vision of the same kind, and one thing or another, the two men come together. They must have both thought it was a rather strange situation. They weren't two people who would naturally come together, you know what I mean? And so in that particular context, Peter begins to, a very surprised Peter, begins to share with Cornelius about Jesus. And among the things that he will say to Jesus in verses 42 and 43 of chapter 10 is this. He says that Jesus commanded us to preach of judgment and the forgiveness of sins. Judgment and the forgiveness of sins. And so it is. I want to continue just being faithful to the Lord in this. And I'm going to preach about this thing. And I'm seeking not to leave anything out. It might not be the most popular message I've ever given. But perhaps for some people it will be the most important. There are two judgments that we can see that are to come. One is to be a, a judgment of punishment. Another one of reward. And Jesus, remember, is the judge in these uh, situations. We'll look at them a little bit more separately in a moment. But God uses these crises to shout at us, to shake us out of complacency. It is as if he would bring us to our senses. You will know the parable of the prodigal son. And in that particular parable, this wayward younger son goes away with his, all his inheritance. And he spends it all in riotous living, says the scriptures, as he goes to a faraway land. Until he finds himself absolutely broke, absolutely penniless, so that he ends up having to go to the most menial job he possibly could have done, and that was to be feeding the pigs. And it says he was so hungry that he would even have eaten the food that the pigs were eating. And it says this, and then he came to his senses. He came to his senses, and as a result of that moment of inspiration, if you like, of revelation, whatever, he decides, I must go back to my father, the father that he had walked away from and left and taken all his possessions from. Do you know, we've got a chance even now to come to our senses. One day it will be too late. One day Jesus will return and it won't be any use at that point, I believe, of being able to say, Lord, Lord, save me. Because we've had our opportunity, we are given our chance. This is the day of salvation. Scripture says. 
Now then, it might well be that we face that particular time of judgment with less apprehension than those who would be unbelievers. But nevertheless, it mustn't mean, you mustn't think that this, this shaking, this, this crisis, this thing that God seeks to say to us won't affect you if you are a believer. Believers can't expect an easy life because of the fact that they believe in Jesus Christ. In fact, far from it. And uh, there's, uh, in, in the second book of Corinthians, Paul has given a resume of his life to a, a group of people. And uh, it goes something like this. I, I've been flogged this many times. I've been stoned this many times, ship, shipwrecked that many times. I've been stoned, I've been imprisoned, and uh, I've been abused, all these kinds of things. He, he, he brings all this out. And uh, I, I knew a preacher once who, who said that when Paul came into a new city, the first thing he went and did was check out the prison because he'd be staying there soon. Well, you get the idea. It's not necessarily that we're going to have health, wealth and happiness if we follow Jesus, at least not in this life. In the parable we saw of the men both uh, building houses, both houses, both men perhaps, got shaken. The storm hit them both. The difference was, of course, that the house that the wise man built stood because it stood and was built on a rock. Now, this rock isn't anything to do with wise investments or good pension plans in this life. It's nothing to do with preparations that we can do down the general avenues of mankind. This rock was Jesus Christ and his teaching. That's what he shared as he spoke to the people about that, that particular parable. Jesus Christ and his teachers, the only secure thing. You watch those, that video of the apples falling on top of my head and all around me uh, earlier on. Actually, the nimble fell on my head, which my daughter, who took the video, was very disappointed about. But nevertheless, as those apples came down, you see, the reason they came down, you can say, they were right, weren't they? Of course they were going to come down. But, but, the fact is that they had broken the bond, or in the midst of breaking the bond with the tree from which they had come. And so they fell. And not only, you won't be so aware of this, not only did the apples fall, but also those a lot of dust came off and bits of twigs and other things. Flotsam and jetsam and then found its way into the tree, basically. They all fell down because they weren't securely attached to the tree. And the only thing Jesus is saying, as he says it's through him and his teaching, that's the only place that you can call a rock and a secure way of place in which to build your life. The only secure place of all these things is the kingdom of God. All else will pass away, but the kingdom of God will last forever. And the kingdom of God is a huge subject in itself. But Jesus, as well as teaching directly about it, he would often say in parables, the kingdom of God is like this, or the kingdom of heaven is like that. He would then give some parable, perhaps, or an example. And uh, he, he would say these things, and he was talking about a place in which God is king. And that the only way into it would be through him, through Jesus. As he talked about the kingdom, he was talking about something that was completely opposite, at odds in many ways, with the kingdom of this world. The kingdom of the things that we see around us. We value the things that people see and advertise about on TV. We advertise looking good. We advertise it making lots of money, having wonderful houses, going on fantastic holidays, all the, these kinds of things. That's what mankind so often now turns to as, as its big values and the things it really seeks. But Jesus said these words, seek first the kingdom of heaven and his righteousness. And all these other things, and he was talking about being fed and clothed and so on, all these other things will be added unto you, will be given to you. He said, you'll have enough in this world but what's really valuable is the kingdom of heaven. And the kind of things that Jesus talked about sometimes, he, he, for example, he talked about how even small gestures of kindness or love would be noted by the Father. He would see those things and he would not forget. He talked about somebody, if you just give a glass of water to somebody, in of course a hot country like that, a passerby might be very thirsty. He said, if you were to just give a glass of water to that person, then you will surely receive a reward for what you have done. 
Small things like that which seem to be like no consequence to us, to be forgotten so quickly. Things done that nobody else will see. Things not done that no one will see other than you. But God sees them. And he values them. And this is all what the kingdom of God is about. It's when, we, it's when first of all, foremost, we put our faith in Jesus Christ. And then when we live our lives according to the teaching he is giving, the, the principles that he puts down before us. That's his, his teachings. And so as we do this, and as we put them into practice by kindness, by love, however we do it, by service to him in different ways, it is noted in heaven. And it's an amazing thing to think about. And they are things that are secure because they are in the kingdom. The things of this world, of this life, can be shaken. But God cannot be shaken. And he will not forget what has been done in his name, his name of Jesus Christ. The Bible speaks not just of individuals being shaken. It speaks about actually all things being shaken. Across various scriptures in the Bible, you will be able to find places where different things are proved to be not secure. Banks, nations, governments, religious institutions, they're all not secure. They're all shaken. They're all impacted on. We've seen some of that in our own lives. Say, say banks. We often talk about bank as being so secure. But in 2007, we saw the lie in that. As banks began to fold, they had to be propped up by, well, by governments primarily and so forth, because they proved to be insecure. They proved to be places that could collapse, just like everything else. Governments we know rise and fall. So forth, we know that none of these things are ultimately totally secure. The basic reason behind all these things is not that mankind has, has found, is not smart enough, as I might say, not clever enough to run its affairs. It's the fact is that we base our lives on the wrong things. Our foundation of our life is corrupt. You see, mankind has rebelled against God and turned to sinful life. It no longer wants to have anything to do with God. People want to do exactly what they want to do, exactly how they want to do it, and they don't want anybody interfering or telling them otherwise. And in doing that, we basically exclude God from our lives. And that has been done now ever since Adam. And the fact is there's a barrier between this world and between God. And because of that breakdown, we don't have that overseeing work of God himself, who would be in the management of all these things, were it not the fact that there has been this breakdown of our relationship with him. He is estranged, as it were, because of their sin. Mankind is so proud. We, we feel that we're clever enough. We feel that we're, we're good enough. We don't need anybody else to help us. We want to live any way we want. The, the saying is, pride comes before a fall. But actually, the scripture says a bit more drastic. It says, pride comes before destruction. Pride comes before destruction. And pride is a major fact in our problems in all these areas. The Bible says quite bluntly, there is no one that is righteous, not one. The whole lot of us have got this aspect of sin in our lives and it's there unless something is done about it. We would all be lost except it were for Jesus. When Jesus came and he died upon that cross, he died there and paid a punishment that should have been ours to pay. Effectively, the judgment that should have been meted out on us was meted out on him on that cross. It's impossible to understand it altogether, but nevertheless, that is what went on. As he died there on that cross, he took the sins of the world, my sins, all these thousands of years later. And as he did that, there was an option for me, a choice. Would I take a hold of the offer that he gives me? I didn't have to take on board his forgiveness. I didn't have to ask him to come into my life because that's what's involved here. Just as we've taken our lives away from God effectively, when we sinned, we need to give them back to him now. And when a person becomes a believer in Jesus Christ, it's more than just saying a few magic words in a prayer. There is a decision, an act of our will, that we give our lives to Jesus. We say, Lord, you died for me. Please forgive me for my sin. Be my Lord and my Saviour. 
and live with me as such for the rest of my life. That's what we're saying to God. And so it is, he comes within us and he expects to be our Lord. And you know, sometimes people will make great steps forward when they become Christians. Uh, things that have bound them down before or something they're released from like that. Other people struggle more with it. But all of us are works in progress. We're all working through issues as the Lord reveals them to us. Certainly I am. Certainly I am. I have a little, uh, I, I, a little thing of my mind. It's just a personal picture. I'm a bit like this and uh, thinking things through. And I, I had this picture and I sometimes think the Lord gets involved in it as I, I'm doing this. And uh, so it was, I was thinking about when the Lord returns, for so he will. And when the Lord returned, and those who were his, the believers, and that would include me, we would go to be with him. And I had this thing of a, there's Jesus there, and then there's crowds of people crowding forward. And I would rather tentatively be walking along at the back. Because I know ways and times, so many, in which I've let him down. I thought, oh, this won't be so easy. And, I, and this picture just goes on that Jesus looked over the crowd. And he said, hello, Ian. Welcome. And I just found that a wonderful thing. It's been with me ever since. I'm not going to suggest it's a prophecy, but it was something that came to me, and I believe it's real, and I believe it's true. It, it kind of brings to end what will happen when we get to be in glory. I've kind of gone off track there a little bit, I've got to admit. But as, you, as I said, Jesus died on that cross for us. There will come a time when the world will be shaken by God the Father. He will shake it like it's never been shaken before. I haven't got time to look at it now, but if you look in Isaiah in chapter 24, there is a shocking description of what it will be like when he returns. You see, this world, this universe in many ways, I guess, Everything is going to be shaken. The Bible says there will be a new heaven and a new earth. The old would be passed away. And uh, that will be an astonishing time for people who know Jesus. It will be wonderful, more wonderful than I can express, more wonderful than you can imagine. For people that do not know him, it will be the most dreadful time that ever there will be. And it will not just be people who are alive when this happens. Physical death is no barrier to God and people will, their spirits will be brought up as well and uh, we will, people will be judged uh, for eternity at that time. They'll make a decision. He will, he will see people and he, the, the question will be, is this person, is he or her, their name's found in the Lamb's Book of Life which is the place of those that have given their lives to Jesus and been his followers. And if their name is in the book, he will welcome them in to eternal life with him in heaven. If their name, if your name, if my name was not found in that book, then we will be judged and have eternal death in hell. That will be judgment. Hell is not Satan's headquarters, it is Satan's fate. He's terrified of hell. He's going there himself because it was created for Satan and his angels. You don't want to go there. You don't want your, your friends, your family to go there. So pray for them that they might give their life to Jesus. Jesus returning. As people say, well, I've had people make the question, people write the question. Is this pandemic the start of the shaking? Is this the start of it? Well, it certainly has caught people's attention, hasn't it? And I can tell you that we've had personal experience just here in this local church of people coming to Jesus during this particular pandemic. It's like something when somebody shakes you. When I was young, uh, my dad used to get up, my dad was a dairy farmer, he used to get up at you know, unearthly times. So at half past four in the morning to go milk the jolly cows or whatever it would be. And uh, so uh, I never followed him into farming, by the way. But you can see why now. But when it, whatever, sometimes I would have to get up early as well. And because I couldn't get up anything like that early, either he or my mum would shake me. Just shake me. Come on. Come on, Ian. Get up. You know, the fact of the matter is, a shaking like that, you know, it just gives an example of what God does to us now. Come on. Wake up. Wake up. Look around you. 
not just at this world, but look beyond that. Look at your life. And is God shaking you right now? Just as these people have come to Jesus here, and many, apparently many people have across the country, which is wonderful news. People have had just this, this chance, this opportunity, perhaps to think, and perhaps also just something saying, oh, is there more to my life than what I thought it was? What about Jesus? What about his claims? Is this for real? Amen it is. Amen it is. And people are responding. It's a verse in scriptures. And it's in fact from the Isaiah, which is also the book I said has such a terrible description uh, of the end times. And there's, there's several others in the scripture as well. And if you want to know any of them, by the way, if you're interested in the things I've said, if some of this is new, you please don't hesitate to contact me. Um, you, I've often given out my email address, I'll just do it now for you. So I'm Ian, that's A I A N dot Roberts at talktalk.net. If you've got questions about any of these things, or you'd like to know where the verses are that I'm sharing with you or others too, please don't hesitate to contact me. I'd be very willing to send them on to you that you can have a look for yourself. But one of those verses in Isaiah is this verse. Seek the Lord what he may be found. Seek the Lord while he may be found. This is your opportunity. This is the time. Now is the time to accept Jesus. You can keep on hedging your bets, say, well, I'll come to Jesus later in life. I'll, I'll do it later. I'll, I'll think about it then. Eventually, later is too late. Now is the time. I promise you, you will not regret it at all. Knowing Jesus is the most wonderful thing. You can know forgiveness for those things in the past that you wish had never happened. Healing too, for he will heal you. The Lord brings healing today, just as he did in the past, as he walked this earth. And we'll pray for healing, as I've said earlier on, but he will also heal those hurts, those wounds, those offences of the past. That guilt, he will heal those things. He will set you free from this. He will deal with their past. He will also give you the assurance of his presence day by day. You will no longer be alone. You will never be alone. You will always have him with you, loving you, helping you, trying to guide you in the right direction as you allow him to, being taken on and being used by him, which is the greatest honour, the greatest privilege. That's why Paul, who I told you went through such terrible times, why he regarded it as a joy, a joy, because he was found so thrilling and satisfying to serve God, to serve his Lord, to serve his Saviour. And I can tell you, I understand a little bit of that. He will do that. So he will deal with your past, he will do your present, and he will give you this future, a certain hope of what is to come. Of an eternity I won't be able to do justice to. I just, because I don't understand it myself. The book of Revelation gives us glimpses of what the place will be like where we are, of what we will do. It gives us just hints of these things, and we can only speculate, I suppose, so far. But no matter what the glory of heaven is, no matter how wonderful the things are we see and we are able to do, nothing will compare with that amazing knowledge, that amazing experience of meeting Jesus. Nothing will compare. So that's why we seek to put our our lives, invest our lives in Jesus and through him in the kingdom of heaven. For that is a kingdom that cannot be shaken. So I implore you, I, I encourage you with all my heart, accept Jesus if you've not. Recommit your life to Jesus if you've been cold to him. If you're somebody that once prayed and said, Lord, come into my life, but now those things have been, been old hat to you, no longer really following them through, then go back to him and say, sorry, forgive me, Lord. I want to repent of that. Help me come back again. I put my faith in you. I, I want to follow you and be the person you want me to be. Please don't mess around with Jesus. You can't fool him, but he won't fool you either. He will, he will give us so much more than we ever we could imagine. I will leave that there. Next week I'm also preaching, I'm going to be preaching on how we respond to this and how we prepare for the things I've just shared. What should we do with our lives? in the light of this shaking. So shaking part two, if you like, will be next week. 
So we're going to go just for a couple of time to inclusion now. I'm just checking to make sure I have enough time. That's why he's some anxious looks there. First of all, if you've accepted Jesus Christ, if you've done, that's wonderful. Just pray that the Lord will anoint you again and fill you with his Holy Spirit. But if you've not, you might like to pray and make this a prayer of your heart. May it be something that you really want to do as you give your life to Jesus. Lord Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. Please forgive me. Come into my life and be my Lord and Saviour. And help me to live for you for all the time I have on this earth. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So please, go through those things. I just pray a blessing upon you now. We're going to let it close the song. That I trust you to stay on and uh, to, to watch it through to the end. Let me just bless you now. In Jesus' name. Lord, I pray for a blessing upon everybody that is present online one way or another. I pray your hand will be upon them for good. I pray, pray they might know your grace in their life, your goodness. And I pray, O oh Lord God, that you would keep them safe and they would know your presence with them in all these difficult days. I pray that you would know more of you day by day. I pray, O oh Lord God, that you would bring things into their life of which they cannot imagine. And Lord, you reveal yourself, an almighty Saviour and a wonderful Lord. I pray this for your glory, Lord, for your honour, in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. The wise man built his house upon the rock. The wise man built his house upon the rock. The wise man built his house upon the rock. And the rain came tumbling down. The rain came down and the floods came up. The rain came down and the floods came up The rain came down and the floods came up But the house on the rock stood firm The foolish man built his house upon the sand The foolish man built his house upon the sand Foolish man built his house upon the sand And the rain came tumbling down The rain came down and the floods came up The rain came down and the floods came up The rain came down and the floods came up And the house on the sand fell flat So build your life on the Lord Jesus Christ And the blessings come tumbling down The prayers go up and the blessings come down The prayers go up and the blessings come down The prayers go up and the blessings come down So build your life on Him The prayers go up and the blessings come down The prayers go up and the blessings come down The prayers go up And the blessings come down So build your life on Him